Who's ready for some word in this house? Now this, I'm going to go ahead and warn you. This is one of those holler back messages, all right? So I'm going to need you to holler back at me when, if you, uh, if you get quiet on me, I might just shut the whole thing down and we'll just pray for three hours. Hallelujah. Um, I know that would make some of y'all real uncomfortable. I'm excited about, uh, about this. I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I was telling, telling Kayla last night. I don't know that I've been this excited about a standalone message in, in quite some time. Um, because I really feel like this, is, this will be one of those. I, is there anybody else that struggles with like delayed gratification in, in here? Uh, y'all are the lionest people I've ever met. My, I'm changing my message. We're going to preach online. Um, one, of the, one of the most challenging things, I, I'll be honest with you, um, I, got, I got really convicted by the Holy Spirit, I don't know, man, probably a year ago um, now, um, and, and, and basically what the conviction was is, is whenever you prepare a message, um, are you preparing it for a response or are you preparing it for transformation? In other words, what, instead, of, instead of trying to figure out the response the message will get, what if we try to discover what are the disciples that that message will produce? The challenge with that as a preacher is, to just to be transparent with you for a moment, is that you don't see that change immediately, Right? I mean, every, every one of us, we get a revelation, and it takes us time to process the revelation, then to apply the revelation, and then to see the fruit of the revelation. Would you agree with me? I mean, unless you're Holy Ghost glow in the dark, and you just walk out of here, you know, with angel wings, and then maybe you're, you're different. But, uh, but, but to be honest with you, that's difficult. But I'm excited because I believe today is one of those days where we'll see instant, instant change. I really believe that revelation that will be shared today is going to be just powerful. It's going to be something that's going to shift your thinking and move you at a place. Every one of us, can, can we be honest? Nobody's happy exactly where you are, right? Maybe you're, maybe you're content with where you're at for a season, but none of us are at a place where we're like, Hey, I, this is where I just want to be the rest of my life, right? We all want to grow. You want to grow in your relationship with God. You want to grow in your relationship with your spouse if you're married. You want to grow in everything, right? We, it's, it's our nature to be wanting to, to expand, to grow. And so, um, so I really want to challenge you to re- really lean into this message because I believe it's going gonna, it's gonna to really transform you from the inside out. Did y'all enjoy Spirit Wars? I told y'all we were going to have fun last week. That was good. That was good. Today, uh, in studying that Spirit Wars series, as we talked about David, I want to continue in that vein. I told you I could preach David 52 weeks a year, and I'd be happy. I love preaching David. I want to look at a story today about David, a pastor of Scripture that's not as well known as some of the other ones. It's not as well known as David and Goliath. It's not as well known as as, as some of the ones like when he gets anointed king. But uh, but it's an interesting pastor of Scripture, and um, I want to talk about something today that is one of my favorite subjects. So I'm talking about my favorite subject, all right? Based on my favorite character, in my favorite church with my favorite people, it ought to be a good day today. Amen. So if y'all if y'all don't holler back at me, I'm gonna be really disappointed. I'm, my feelings hurt. I'm fragile today. All right, I'm very I right, am sensitive. So I need you to help me out with this thing. Y'all ready for some word? If you've got your Bibles, turn with me or your apps, your phones, your tablets, whatever. If you want to turn with me, I want you to turn to two places so you can get your little your little ribbon bookmark out that you've never used. I'm just messing with you. I'm talking about your neighbor. Don't get offended. And uh, I want to start. I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 24. You can put your finger there and leave it there. And Then I want to look real quick at two verses from Psalms 57. I want to talk today about your pathway to purpose. How many of you would agree that you have a purpose? Do you, do you, do you believe that? That's literally, guys, all right, here's what we're going to do. I want everybody that took a shower this morning to raise your hand. Praise God. See how easy that is? Everybody that's breathing today, raise your hand. See how easy that is? All right. Everybody that believes they have purpose, raise their hand. Okay, just wanted to make sure. All right. So so I want to talk today about the pathway that God has for your purpose. Because how many of you realize that your purpose is a place that you probably haven't arrived at yet? Would you agree? I can promise you that you've not fulfilled all God has for you. Well, how do you know that? Are you a prophet? No, because if you had, you wouldn't be here today. Because when you get poured out completely, God will take you up. But God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. And he filled you with his spirit, not so you could go to heaven one day. He filled you with his spirit so you could bring heaven to earth today. 
So you have a purpose. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know what season of life you're in. But I promise you, God has a purpose for you. The thing about purpose is, though, that purpose is a journey. It's a journey. You don't just discover it and boom, you're there. That's not how it works, okay? You have to take, travel a path that leads you from where you begin all the way to where you end up. Somebody say amen. Amen. So that journey is known in our religious circle as the process, all right? Process is an ugly word, right? Because we are instantaneous. We like things right now. I talked about it a while ago. Right? We want a microwave. We want to stick my sinner's prayer in a microwave and, be, and have fully sanctified in 30 seconds. And that's not how it works. Your salvation was in a moment. It was an event. Your sanctification is a process. You do not get sanctified in one moment. Your spirit does, but your soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions, your physical body, somebody say amen. amen. Right? The Bible tells us, right, that we, we got saved. We were given a new spirit. We became a new creation, right? That's our spirit. But our soul is being transformed. That's what Paul said. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's a process. And then he goes on to say that one day our bodies will be glorified. We'll be given a new body. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Just smile at your neighbor and say, I kind of like my body. Anyway, so, so, so we know that there is a process that is involved. And I want to talk for a few moments today about the pathway to your purpose, the pathway to your purpose. Psalms 57, here's what I want you to do. Stand your feet for me. I want to read this. I'm just reading two verses, and then I'll jump to 1 Samuel 24 a little bit later. Psalm 57, when you got it, say amen. I'm going to read out of the New Living here. It says this, Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. I cry out, verse 2 says, to God most high, to God who will fulfill his purpose for me. I want to read verse 2 again because that's the one I want to focus on. Listen to this. I cry out to God most high, to God who will fulfill his purpose for me. Before you find your seat, I want you to high five three people and just tell them, You're on the pathway to your purpose. I love love this passage of Scripture. I even love how it starts out. I don't focus on verse 2, but I love in verse 1 how David starts out. He says, you know, have mercy on me, O God. You just hear the heart of David, how he was always submissive to God. He's like, have mercy on me. I look to you for my protection. And then I love it because he says, I hide beneath the shadow of your wings until danger passes by. And one of the reasons I love this is because it shows us the vulnerability of David, right? Because when we think of David, we think of the guy that slayed the giant. We can think of the guy that slayed tens of thousands of Philistines, right? We think of the guy who was king. He was David, a man after God's own heart. He was like the brave heart of the Old Testament, right? And and that's what we think of David. But we see here the humanity of David. We see the vulnerability of David. We see how in this moment that David, the king, the one that slayed the giant, even he faces fear. See, fear is a part of life. Would you agree? You're going to go through things. All right? We know that fear is not of God. He didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. But fear, fear tries to come on you when you go through situations that you're uncertain of. And David went through plenty of situations where he didn't know the outcome. He knew that God was good. He knew that God was in a good mood. He knew that God loved to bless. But he also understood that life happens. So therefore, David found himself sometimes in precarious positions where people that were even close to him wanted to kill him. His mentor wanted to kill him. His son wanted to kill him, okay? I know you think you got it bad, but I'm talking about Jerry Springer stuff up in here in 1 Samuel. And and so David faced all kinds of issues. And he recognized that there's times when fear tries to come upon him. But I love this because he shows us, he says, when I get fearful, I find my rest in the shadow of your wings. See, this way, it's, it's, it's not a sin to have fear. It's, 
What becomes a sin is when we allow it to separate us from God because we allow fear to take us in a different direction. And David knew. David said, look, sometimes, I'll be honest with you guys, I know you're going to read about me 2,000 years from now and you're going to say, man, that joker had it going on. But I, I'm going through some stuff too and there's times where I feel fear. But what I've learned to do is when I feel fear, I make sure that I go to the right place. I know where to go. I know where my help comes from. I know where my strong tower is. I know where he is that can protect me in all of his ways. So David knew where to turn. But then he gets to verse 2. And I love verse 2. Because in verse 2 he says, I cry out. It's one thing to turn to God, but it's a whole other thing to cry out to God. He said, I cry out to God, the Most High, who fulfills his purpose for me. You didn't catch that. How many of y'all got a purpose? How many of y'all are interested in fulfilling your purpose? But David says, I cry out to God, and the God that I cry out to is who fulfills my purpose. In other words, David recognized that he had a purpose, and God had called him to something, but he also recognized that the only way to fulfill what God had called him to was to put his trust in God. He said, I know you've called me to something, God, but I can't get there by myself. I need to help you on this right here. You can't fulfill your purpose. Jesus said it best in John 15. Apart from me, you can't do anything. But with God, all things are possible. So I've got to make sure that I trust in Him to receive what I need to operate according to the purpose that He dictated for me. I want to give you three things today as we talk about the pathway to purpose. So if you're writing, taking notes, you can jot these down. He says, God fulfills purpose for me. It doesn't mean you don't play a part. That doesn't mean you become a spiritual couch potato, a spectator to your own story. But it just means that it's not you. I, lo I love how uh, Paul said it best in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. He says this, he says, In this earthen vessel there's a treasure. And the excellence of the power of this is the treasure. But it's not of me, it's of God. So he recognizes that it's him, but it's not really him. It's he who is in him. Christ in me, my hope of glory. So you're going to play the part. God's not going to do it for you. God's going to do it through you. All right? Here's point number one. God has called you to fulfill His purpose with His power. God has called you to fulfill His purpose with His power. I love some of y'all got some amazing minds because you don't write nothing down. You retain it all. Hallelujah. God has called you to fulfill His purpose with His power. Everybody has purpose. Here's the good news for you. Not only do you have purpose, you have power. I'm going to go over here to the love. Nobody over here said anything. Not only do you have purpose, you have power. Not only do you have purpose, you have power. If he just gave you purpose, that would be a bad thing. Because there's nothing more frustrating than to know what you're supposed to do but not have what you need to do it. But you have purpose and you have power. Just tell your neighbor on the left side, say, I have purpose. Now tell your other neighbor, the one you ignored the first time, and tell him, I also have power. Just tell, Say it like you, you got to tap it, I got the power. God gives you purpose, but then God gives you power to fulfill your purpose. Now, here's one of the first challenges that we face when it comes to understanding purpose is trying to figure out what our purpose is. Would you agree with me? Most people are searching through life trying to find their purpose. Rick Warren wrote a bestseller called The Purpose Driven Life. And it really activated people's, it opened up their minds to this idea that everyone was created for something. Like you're created more than to exist. Jesus didn't say, I've come that you may exist. He said, I've come that you have life. There's a difference between having life and existing. And, 
and so, 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 so we're talking here about purpose, and people don't understand how to find their purpose. Now, the first principle you need to understand about finding your purpose is purpose is discovered, not determined. So you don't get to decide your purpose. All right, let me say it like this. Whoever creates a thing determines the purpose of a thing. When Steve Jobs created an iPhone, he determined what the purpose of the iPhone was. If you take an iPhone and go hammer a nail, it's going to bust. Why? Because that's not the purpose of it. And you don't get to decide what its purpose is. The person who created it decides the purpose. So let me talk to you for a minute. You didn't create you. Mom and daddy didn't create you. God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. God created you, so when God created you, God gets to determine what your purpose is. Your purpose is not determined. Your purpose is discovered. And so when we're trying to discover our purpose, here's our first problem. Our first problem is we are programmed from birth by our culture to look outside of ourselves to find purpose. So when we're little, they say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you want to be this, that, this, that, or this? And so most of us grow up wanting to be Neil Armstrong, an astronaut, or Michael Jordan, a ball player. And so we think, what, what we do is we begin to set our course according to someone else's purpose. As a child. And so we teach people. So then what we've done is we have reinforced this entire Babylonian system that tells us the purpose of the system is to help us discover purpose. So if you go to us and we educate you for 13 years, you pay us a bunch of money, we'll give you four more years. If you're really smart or really lazy like me, you'll get another four years. And then by then, we'll tell you, give you your options of what you're called to do. And people spend all that time and money, they get out with a college degree and they don't even do what they went to school for. Why? Because it takes us that long to figure out our purpose. Can I just speak to some folks for a minute? Because there's a lot of folks in here that never went to higher education. You need to stop disqualifying your... Higher education doesn't disqualify you for anything in the kingdom. You can have more degrees than a thermometer. And still not have any idea what God called you to do. And I'm not against education. I, I went and got my master's degree. After, listen, after 14 years of higher education, I ought to have something. But I'm going to tell you right now, that didn't determine my purpose. That didn't help me discover my purpose. And there's some of you that don't think you can do what God's called you to do because you had not never been to school. All the educational folks are mad as the devil right now. Get behind me, Satan. That's what the world tells you. That's how the world tells you to discover your purpose. That's not what God said. The world tells you you've got to do these things, and if you do all these things, we'll help you figure out your purpose. You know what God says? Put your trust in me, and I'll show you your purpose, and I'll give you the power to fulfill your purpose. So why are you going, can I help? I just need to speak to some parents for a moment. Stop putting all the pressure on your children to be what everybody else thinks they should be. Because nobody else determines their purpose. And so we, we, we begin to look outside of our purpose. Do you know why everybody, can I help y'all out? I'm a, I'm a, man, this is going to be good. I, I hope I get through the sermon, but either way, this part's going to be good. Do you know why everybody's living in stress? Because everybody's trying to fulfill somebody else's purpose. You are. And you're, you're judging your ability to fulfill purpose based on what somebody else's purpose is. And preacher, we're the world's worse at this. Because we look at somebody else who's got a bigger church and we go, well, I wish I had that. I wish I was that. Well, maybe God didn't call you to that. But the problem is when we begin comparing we get outside our purpose. And the, the, the most tragic thing you can experience in life is fulfilling a purpose you were never called for. It is. 
We're so scared of failing at what we're called to do. I'm scared of succeeding at what I'm not called to do. Because I don't want to wake up 60 years from now and go, oh my goodness, I gave my life to something God never called me to. That's sad. That's sad. So, so you, you gotta, you've got to get your purpose. The only way... To, uh, so anybody want to know how to discover your purpose? Huh? Let me help you out. You, do, you, do you really want to know how to discover your purpose? Okay. So 75% of the people in here didn't say yes. So would you like for me to just tell them after service? Or would you like to cover your ears while I share this? Because I don't know that you want to know. You may want to know. Let me ask you, are, not are you ready to hear it, are you ready to do it? Do you know how to discover your purpose? Serve. I knew I shouldn't have said yes. He tricked me. Serve. 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 We're going to talk about David. Do you know how David discovered his purpose? He served. He served. He served everywhere God put him. When they put him on in the middle of nowhere tending sheep, so everybody forget about him, he served. They called him to a party because that it was in his honor that he didn't even know about when they were going to anoint him king. He didn't even get invited to the party that he was going to be anointed king. He shows up, they anoint him king. Do you know what they did then? Sent him right back out to where he came from. You know what he did when he got there? You know, you, know, you know what happened? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that after the prophet Samuel at Jesse's house anointed David, Samuel left and went back to the city, and it says David went back to the wilderness. Do you know why? You know what, you know what we want to do? We want to discover our purpose and go, I ain't doing nothing else. You know what David did? He served. So he goes back out and he serves. Then his father says, hey, I want you to go take this food to your brother's. So you know what he did? Served. He shows up. They say, hey, what's that noise? That's a giant. Well, why ain't y'all killed the giant? Have you seen that giant? Well, I'll, I'll kill him because he ain't coming against me, coming against God. Uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of God, y'all need to take this dude out. So he wipes out the giant. He gets elevated to be general. You know what he does? Serves. Serves the king. He's serving a position that he's already been told he's going to have. He's, ser he's, ser he's sitting there going, wait a minute. This is what the God, God told me I was going to do. But until my time is right, I'm just going to serve him. The king tried to kill him. You know what he kept doing? Serving. I told you you didn't want to know. Well, I just want to know what my purpose is. Well, what are you doing? What are you doing to serve? Did, what are you doing for God? I'm just waiting. I'm waiting on the Lord. We'll keep waiting. The Bible didn't say that purpose found David when he was sitting on the couch waiting for an, a word from God. God found David when he was serving God. All the amens. Shh. That's serving. So can I ask you a question? If, if you're struggling in finding your purpose, I want to ask you where you're serving. Are you serving? Are you serving somewhere? Well, what if I do it and it's not right? That's fine. At least you can check. You know what I found out? I can serve in areas that I'm not called to serve in, and it don't take me long to figure out I can mark that one off the list. It's gotten real quiet all up in this church. Huh? The baby's the only one amening. Serve. Serve. You want to discover, because you know what happens when you start to serve? First of all, see, you need to understand something. God doesn't have any problem hitting the moving target. You ain't got to be still. You know what I love? David served his purpose everywhere he was placed. If you'll serve your purpose, here's what I found. Purpose will discover you. You don't have to discover it. Purpose will find you. Well, I don't know why they don't ever ask me to do that because you'll never do nothing. We don't know if you can. Well, you know, I... I had somebody tell me one time, I don't care if you like it or something, I'm going to be honest with you. I had somebody tell me one time, I said, well, I, I, I enjoyed your church, but y'all never asked me to do anything. I was like, oh, okay. So you missed that part when we said we'd love to have you serve. 
You missed the part where we say, we, we, we'd love to have you on board and serving God in certain ways. You missed all that part. Now, what you wanted is you wanted platform. See, most people say they want to discover purpose, but what they really want is platform. And if you're seeking platform, you'll miss purpose. And there's a lot of people on platforms that are not serving purpose. It's going to get better as it goes along, but you're just going to have to endure this part because I'm enjoying this. You, purpose. God calls you to fulfill his purpose. And, and, and don't think that... See, here's the other issue that I have about serving in church is we only, want, we only think we can be valuable to God if we serve in positions that we deem valuable. So we think like... Oh, well, if I was the worship leader, sure, I would serve because I'm up there on stage and I would make a difference. And, and I don't know what vacuuming the floors, how that's going to glorify God. Because here's the thing. I don't know how shake, holding the door for somebody out front, how that's really going to glorify God. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus said last, he said, everything you do, you do it unto me. So whenever you serve, if you want to know how to serve me, you serve others as if they were me. And whenever you serve others, you're serving me. And Jesus never said, serve from here. Serve where you are. Well, I want to be elevated in the kingdom. That's fine. Do you know what Jesus said? The greatest way to elevate in the kingdom is to serve. He said the greatest in the kingdom is the one who serves. Well, I just don't know what God wants. God won't speak to me. God's speaking, but, I'm, but you, God, God don't sit on your couch all the time. God don't sleep late on Sunday mornings. Being ugly. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll back off. I want to read a scripture for you. Check this out in Psalm 78. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. This right here is a sheep pen. Now, you might not think it's a sheep pen, but if you had a sheep and we put it in, it wouldn't get out. So it's a sheep pen, <laughs> Pastor Lewis. The Bible says that God chose David while he was serving in the sheep pen. See, you thought God chose David because he had the ability to slay a giant. No. God didn't choose David based on his gift. God chose David based on his heart, his nature, his character. Because gifts can get you to a place that if you don't have the character, you can't stay there. There's been a, there was a lot of people in the Old Testament coronated as king, but some couldn't stay there because they didn't have the character to keep them there because they weren't willing to serve. But the Bible says that God chose David while he was serving in the pens, tending the sheep that he brought him. I love that. Y'all want a modern translation? My young people started from the bottom, now we're here. That's what that means. Like when you think your calling starts here, you're never going to get started on your calling. It's quiet up in here. All right? So we're talking about discovering that purpose. If I serve, I get enlightenment each time. And God finds out he can trust me with the things a little so he can give me more. But if you've never shown you can do anything with little, don't be mad because you hadn't been given more. We're going to move on because some of y'all are so mad right now. I mean, it's amazing. But David, David, here's David, y'all. He's in a minimum wage job serving his purpose at the time. He's not seeking promotion. He's serving purpose. Tweet that. Stop seeking promotion and start serving purpose. 1 Samuel 24. I'm just going to read five verses. Actually, I'm going to read three. We'll go back and get four and five later. 1 Samuel 24, verse 1. Listen to this. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. 
So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel and set out to hunt for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. So here, let me, let me lay the foundation for you. Here we have a scenario where David is hiding from Saul because Saul has declared he wants to kill David. Saul is the king. David's been serving the king, but Saul gets jealous because David is getting more credit than the king. Saul has killed his thousands. David his tens of thousands. David wins the popularity vote. Saul gets mad and wants him dead. So Saul starts chasing David. David takes his men and they go and they would hide. Now we talked about this a couple weeks ago because it's interesting that Saul is at his palace. He just gets through pursuing the Philistines on a conquest. He's back in his palace and a messenger shows up and tells Saul where David is. Anybody want to guess who the messenger was? If you missed the Jezebel spirit, you missed it. He shows up and says, hey, David and his men are here in Engadi. So Saul gets 3,000. David's got 400. Saul gets 3,000. says, let's go find him. They come to a place near the crags of the wild goats, and he came to the sheep pens along the way, and there was a cave there. Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. Now, I want you to, I want you to think about this for a moment. Put yourself in David's shoes. He was anointed to be the future king after not even being invited to the party. He shows up to give his brother some lunch. He gets invited to slay a giant. He slays a giant. He, all the Israelites plunder the Philistines' camp. They get everything they want. King Saul is victorious. Everything's going well. He gets elevated to a general. He leads conquest in the name of King Saul and slays thousands of Philistines. He expands King Saul's kingdom all the time knowing that he is actually not in the position he's going to end up in. He does all of that and then the king gets jealous and wants to kill him for helping him. So David's called to be a king but he's running like a refugee. You missed that. He's called to be a king. This is what God's told you. But this is your reality. Have you ever felt like you were called to something greater than your current present reality looks like? Because he knew the promise God had given him, but he knew the present reality of where he was living. And David, knowing what he's called to, is at a place that looks nothing like what God spoke to his heart. I want to ask you this morning, are you at a place where you know God's called you to something that's bigger than what you currently see, but you feel like you're constantly on the run because all you're facing is attack. You've been promised victory, but you're staring defeat in the face. And David is running for his life. He's got his men with him. He's on his way to fulfill his calling, his purpose. But he's running from what's chasing him. But what if the place you are, the place where David was, have you ever looked back on your life and you, you find out where you are and you look back and you try to figure out the wrong turn that you took because you ended up at a place that doesn't look like where you thought you were going? I mean, is there any transparent people in the house today that will be willing to say, you know what? I didn't plan it like this. I never planned a failed marriage. I never planned a failed business. I never planned for my child not to speak to me. I never planned to end up at this place. And you begin looking back trying to figure out where you went wrong to end up in this dead end road. But what if the place where you are isn't a dead end road, but it's a stoplight? What if, it, what if this isn't the end? It's just a pause in your story. What if, what if you're at a, at a stoplight? You know, you know what's interesting about stoplights is stoplights, stoplights are like the most annoying thing in the world when you travel. Would you agree? I mean, does anybody in here like, like a stoplight? 
Like if so, we're going to start a small group for you. And it'll be small. But, but most of us are annoyed by stoplights because stoplights interrupt our journey. And when we're going somewhere, and you know, we live in Wallace, let's be honest, there's three stoplights in Wallace. So, I mean, it's not like it's a major issue. If you, if you, if you have road rage in Wallace, then we need to talk. Because, like, there's a deeper issue. Like, they just repaved the roads, and we have people flipping out. I mean, Lord have mercy, you ain't never been to Atlanta or Baltimore. But, like, when you go to Wilmington and the stoplights catch you, it can add 15 or 20 minutes to where you're going. Right? So they can be annoying. But you know what I found about stoplights is, 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 is really stoplights get a bad name. Because the purpose of a stoplight is to, to protect you. Because if, if the light is red and you don't stop, then you're going to get hurt more than your feelings. And so, so, so the, the purpose of the stoplight is to keep you out of harm's way. Because the timing's not right for you to pass through where you're trying to go. And sometimes I've found that God puts stoplights in our journey to keep us from stepping into a place that we aren't ready for. You know the other thing about stoplights, Pastor Cedric, is I found, man, stoplights are good because they keep you engaged. You know, when's the last time you heard of somebody falling asleep and wrecking their vehicle in the middle of town? Don't happen, right? And if you did, they won't sleep. They were drunk. Let's just be clear. But you don't fall asleep right here. All the wrecks where you fall asleep happen on the interstate. And on the interstate, there's no stoplights. And I've found that life sometimes can be like roads. And sometimes we can get on a path that's nice and easy. And we can set the cruise control and we can become comfortable. But the problem is if there's no divine interruptions, then I can fall asleep at the wheel. And I believe we got a lot of Christians who are falling asleep at a wheel because you're driving along a road that's so comfortable you don't even need to pay attention. Stoplights. Stop hating stoplights. Stoplights are just high five somebody say stoplights are good. Just tell somebody, say, I like stoplights. Y'all want to tell you a true story, true story? Listen, about, about, probably about uh, eight, seven, eight years ago, I, I would go over to, uh, to Richlands, and there was a pastor there named Dr. Kelly Varner, and Dr. Varner's written like 47 books, and everybody you can think of has come and sat at his feet and learned from him. He knew the word better than anybody I've ever met. And, um, and, and I would go over, and I would meet him in Richlands, and we would drive over to Jacksonville and have lunch. And I, and I, I got there. You got to understand, Doctor Varner is very apostolic, and he's very. He just tell you exactly. You didn't have to ask Doctor Varner's opinion; he would let you know. And so I pulled up the first time. I'll never forget. I pull up, and he had a he had a, a Lincoln Navigator. And I pull up. I, am, uh, I don't remember what I was driving time, but I pull up and I get out, and I said, you know, Doctor Varner, I'd be glad to drive if you want me to. He said, No, y'all drive. I was like, well, I really don't mind. He said, Boy, I don't know you. <laughs> okay, I don't know how you drive, so get in my car. Yes, sir. So we would go to eat lunch. We would drive to Jacksonville. And every time we would come to a red light, he'd stop and he'd go, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So he did it the first time and I was like, so we came to the next stoplight. And he said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then we come to the next red light and he'd say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And so finally, after a light, I didn't say anything. The first time I went to lunch, I was just like, I don't know what that is, but I ain't asking. But after about two or three times I have a lunch, one time I said, Dr. Barnes, let me ask you a question. I said, I noticed that every time we come to a stoplight, you say, thank you, Lord. I was like, I, I just wonder what is it is. He said, well, this is what I've come to understand. So he said, everybody can't drive. And he said, I'm thankful because some of these fools, I'm just thankful to make it to the next one because some of these fools will kill you out here. <laughs> he said, but the second thing I've learned, I want you to catch this. He said, the second thing I've learned is this. He said, a stoplight gives me an opportunity to take a moment to reflect of where I've come from and thank God that I've made it where I am. He said, so I may not be where I'm going yet, but I thank God that I'm not where I started. And see, some of y'all need to thank God that you're at a place that you may not have arrived where the word told you you were going yet, but you've come to a pause in your story. And it doesn't look like the last chapter, but you ought to thank God you're not at the first chapter. I may not be where I want to be, but I thank God I'm not where I used to be. 
Somebody ought to give God a praise for a stoplight. Stoplights. I'm preaching stoplights up in this house. David's on his way to becoming king, but along the way he's hiding in a cave. Think about that. The promise of a throne, the reality of a cave. The promise of reigning. The reality of fleeing. He knows he has a promise. But he also knows he's got to go through a process. Number two, God has given you a promise with his process. God has given you a promise. He's also given you a process. I want you to think about this because it's interesting. The text says here in verse 2 or 3, verse 2 and 3, it says, So Saul took 3,000 able young men from Israel, set out to look for David and his men to the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. So Saul and his men are looking for David. Saul goes into a cave that is there, and the scripture tells us that Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. Now, before you bind races, I want to explain to you what that means because there's a Hebrew phrase here that needs to be broken down. Saul, when it says he relieved, had to relieve himself, that means Saul had to go to the bathroom. That's it. That's as spiritual as it gets. Saul had to use the bathroom. Um, come here, Tyler. Come here. Come here for a minute. We're going we're gonna to make you a shepherd, all right? So, so you just stand in the sheep pen for me. You need some sheep. I think, come here, Brevin. Come here, Brevin. Come here. Be a sheep. Be a sheep. Just say bye. There you go. Good sheep. Come here, Pastor Jamil. We're going to make you king. It's his first time being king. Y'all cut him a break. There you go. You look good. Huh? You got a crown. That's an ugly crown. All right. Saul. Come here, Saul. Come here, Saul. Saul, King Saul and his men show up looking for David. The Bible says they come to the sheep pen and just beyond the sheep pen there's a cave. Pastor Lewis, come here for a second. Help me. Help me with this. All right, that's, that's good. If, if you just kind of stand by there. So Saul comes to a cave. They're searching for David. And he tells his men, he says, hey, guys. He says, I'm a, I got to go in and use the bathroom. Now, I don't know. Bible doesn't tell us if it was number one or number two. And it really don't matter, okay? But we know he had to relieve himself. So Saul comes. He passes the sheep gate. He goes into the cave. This is our cave, all right? And he's going to go over here to the... You need to be out. Don't let everybody see you. Right? He goes into the cave to relieve himself. Now, no, no, don't go ahead. No, we're not going to... No, no, we're not going to go ahead. All right, all right you just... All right? So Saul is in the cave. Are you with me? Saul is in the cave using the restroom. He walks past the sheep pen into the cave. Now he's in the cave relieving himself. But the Bible says David was in the cave too. So, 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 so come here. I need, I need to, come here, Didier. Come here, fish. Come here. Come here. 
So David and his men are in the cave, in the back of the cave. So Saul didn't see him. Saul comes in. He's just going to mind his own business. He pulls out his newspaper. <laughs> and he's taking a break. Yeah, he's relieving himself. He doesn't realize that David and his men, put that down, you make me nervous. <laughs> David and his men are in the cave. Okay, all right, stay with me, stay with me. David has a promise but he's got to go through a process. The distance between your present and your promise is your process. And you can only have the promise of God if you're willing to go through the process of God. God won't honor his promise if you don't honor his process. And what happens with us is we get a promise and we think that we just inhabit the promise without going through the process. But the problem with skipping the process is if you skip the process, when you get the promise, you can't handle the promise. And, and, and so David knows he's got a promise. This is supposed to be David's. But this is where he's at, hiding in a cave. Are you with me? You have to honor the process to inhabit the promise. And I want to help you out here because what happens is we don't want to go through process so we try to get our own promise. Okay, 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 let me say it last. You don't want a promise that God didn't give you. Yeah, y'all not catch me, not catch me. You don't want a husband or a wife that God didn't give you. You don't want a responsibility that God didn't give you. And when we try to usurp the process to obtain a promise, we're trying to get something that's not ours. Are you with me? Everybody good? Verse 4. The men say, this is the day. They're talking to David now. They're in, they're in the cave. David, they're just chilling, hanging out. They're like, man, did you see that? Saul just came in to the cave where we are, right? Mm -hmm. This is the most diverse army I've ever seen. <laughs> he said, so, so David's sitting here. They watch Saul and they're like, and the men say, listen to this. This is the day the Lord spoke of when he told you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. That's what his men say. L let me help you with this. Saul is chasing David. David's hiding in a cave. Saul, unbeknownst to him, goes in the cave to use the bathroom. Now the very one who is chasing David is in a vulnerable position. Like, David is here with a sword. Saul is here with a newspaper. Saul never sees him coming. David can end this thing right here, right now. And David's men are thinking, hey, Captain, if you'll do, this is what God told you. If you'll do this now, we won't have to run anymore. You'll be king. We'll be where God told us we were going to be. And David's guys realize it. They say, this is the day the Lord spoke of. Take advantage of your opportunity and kill this sucker. But here's David. God's promised him a throne. Saul's tried to kill him. He's got every right to kill Saul. 
not only does Saul have what is his, but Saul's already tried to kill him. And before you get holy roller on me, this is on the other side of the cross. An eye for an eye. He has every reason to kill him. But he knows in his heart that's not God's will. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. Wait a minute, Pastor. It is God's will because God told him he would be king. Yeah, but sometimes your heart discerns what your head can't make sense of. And looks can be deceiving. And it looks like what God promised, but he knows that's not what God wants. And you can only discern that if you're in relationship with the one who speaks to your heart. And most Christians will jump at an opportunity that looks like God, feels like God, sounds like God, smells like God, and you try to do something and you fail and you get mad at God. But you never heard the voice of God speak to your heart and say, not like this. Just tell somebody, say, not like that. Not like that, not like that, not like that. Everything makes sense. It looks just like what God promised. But I know in my heart. And you know what's interesting to me is even the people that David surrounded himself with, people who love David and people who love God. Go read the end of the story. They assumed this is what God wanted. So you got to be real. Do you, wanna, do you know why your pastor won't tell you what God said for you to do? Because I can look at something from my perspective and see God in it. And I can tell you yes. And it may be, see, see, here's what I found, Brother Lee. The enemy is real good at wrapping truth in a lie. And it'll make it, see what they said wasn't totally untrue. God had promised that he would deliver David's enemies into his hands. But there's one thing in that phrase that you can look through all the scriptures in your Bible. All the conversations between God and David. All of the scriptures from Samuel all the way through Kings. And what I have yet to be able to discover, because they, they said, hey, don't you remember what God said? God said he was going to put deliver the enemies into your hands. Yep. But then they said one thing. They said, for you to deal with as you wish. They said, hey, did, remember when God had that, con you and God were up there on that mountain that time, and we was out there chilling, and God spoke to you and said, hey, hey, uh, Captain, I'm going to give you all the enemies into your hands and you just get to do it in whatever you want to. You remember that conversation? And David says, oh, I, I remember part of that conversation. Now, the last part I'm not familiar with. God did promise that he would give his enemies into his hand, but he never said, do it like you want to do it. So here it is. An opportunity presents itself for David to take with force the promise that God has promised him. And you know what I found, Pastor Lewis, is, is like you really don't know where your heart is until opportunity presents itself. Because we can always say, I, I think I know what I would do. But until you're there, you really don't know what you would. You, know you know what I love? And I mean this dripping with sarcasm. I love folk that ain't never had children. That will look at you and say, when I have children, or if those were my children, I wouldn't do what you do. I just want to politely just say, shut up. In the Holy Ghost. But you don't know what you'll do until the opportunity presents itself. And here's David, and the opportunity has presented itself. So here's what he does. He does something very interesting. David goes, and he takes his sword, this is the same sword that used to be Goliath's sword. The sword that he took from Goliath and he cut off his head. Then he took it to the temple. And then when he was fleeing from Saul, he actually went back 
in the temple of Nob, and he actually goes back and says, hey, I, I need that. Do you have a weapon? And the guy says, oh, I've got the sword that you killed Goliath with. So he gives him that weapon back. So he's holding the very sword that took the head off the giant. And now he can take the head off the thing that stands between him and his promise. So you've got to catch this. Goliath was an obstacle between David and his destiny. And David slayed what was the obstacle to get to his destiny. But you better be careful you don't think just because you did it one way one time. That's how God wants you to do it every time. He goes over with that sword while Saul is relieving himself. And instead of killing him, he cuts off a corner. He, he cuts off a corner of his robe. And then he goes back. He, he cuts off a corner of his robe. He, he cut, we're talking about pathway to purpose. And so he goes, and he doesn't kill Saul like you think he would. Instead, he cuts a corner. He's on a path to somewhere, but he cuts a corner. He cuts a corner. He, he's taking a shortcut. He cuts a corner. And you know what's interesting is, is in verse 5, it says that David became grieved. It, it hurt his heart because of what he'd done. And I'm reading it, and I'm like, God, he ought to have been like, see, I could have took that jugger out. Y'all know how we'd have been, right? Barbershop on Saturday morning, you'd been like, yeah, that joke, he, we bought, got some, but I just let him go this time. And the Bible says, David went to his men, and he said, my heart is grieved because I, what I did to that Lord, I did to that Lord. And, and I was like, God, I do not understand this at all. Like, you ought to be like, man, David, he showed so much self-control because he could have just took that thing like he wanted it. He could have got what was supposed to be his and done it his way. And instead, he said, you know what? I'm going to wait on God. Because here's where David's at, y'all. David is standing right before his promise. All he's got to do is swing the sword one time, and he's king. He's exactly what God told him he was going to be years earlier. Like, why didn't David take advantage of the opportunity? But not only did he not take advantage of the opportunity, he shows mercy and then he feels bad because of what he did do, which is nothing compared to what most of us would have done. And I was like, why did David do that? And here's what I realized. David is in the cave. Saul is vulnerable. You know what I really think happened? David is standing here with his sword and he's thinking about what he can do. And he hears a noise from outside the cave. <laughs> he hears a sick sheep. <laughs> he hears... He hears this noise from outside. See, see you got to understand something. To put this in perspective, you have to understand David's life. Because everything David always did, he gave his full heart to. Everywhere he served, he served purpose. When he was tending the sheep, he served those sheep. He served his father, even when he wasn't appreciated. When he served King Saul, he served him, even when he was hated. He always did everything with his whole heart. And now he gets an opportunity, and he cuts a corner. And I'm sitting there thinking, why didn't David just take him out? And I think David, he had that sword drawn. He's thinking to himself, God, is this really what you want? I really believe he prayed about it because that was David. And I think he probably heard this sound from the sheep pen. See, catch this. David started out here. He ends up here. But he's in the middle of his process between where he started and where he's going. See, I need to help some of you out because some of you, I'm not going to hit you, sir. Some of you, 
Some of you don't think you can fulfill your purpose because of where you started. But there's something more powerful than where you started. And that's where you're going. See, where you're going is more powerful than where you started. But stay with me, stay with me. Because David, he thinks about where he came from. And he thinks to himself, I can take him out. I can, I can become king right now. All I got to do with my own power is swing this sword. And then he says, you know what? I think in a moment, his heart speaks to him and he says, yeah, but I'm not that kind of king. I'm not that kind of king. That's not, that's not who I am. I could do it that way, but that's not, that's not who I am. I can make this thing happen. See, David was at a moment. He was at a Psalms 57 moment. When he says, God, whom I cry out to, fulfills my purpose. And he's got a decision to make. Do I trust God to fulfill the purpose that he's put in my life? Or do I take matters into my own hands and make it happen my way? And this is what I found is that God wants you to do his will his way. It's not just enough to do his will. He wants you to do his will his way. You know, it's interesting Many of us are moving towards a purpose that we feel like God's called us to. But if you aren't careful, you'll take shortcuts to get to purpose and you'll violate yourself in the process. When we started out this ministry 11 years ago, we started out with a handful of folk and a vision statement. And we were going to expand the kingdom of God by breaking down walls and building up dreams. And we, we set on a course, we, we charted that thing, and we said, but we're going full steam ahead. And about three years into it, I remember looking back one day and saying, who are we? I'm, can I be honest? We had made every ministry within 30 miles of here mad because we showed up and we had to answer We had put forth, bowed out our chest and said, hey, we're, we're here. And we're going to do it. We're going to build the kingdom. And we're going to tear down walls of racism. And we did. And we're going to destroy walls of separation. And we did. And we're going to build dreams in people's hearts. And we did. But what we didn't realize is, is that we left a weight behind us. And we didn't take into account that we were so vision driven that we really didn't care how we got there as long as we got there. And, and, and so I remember sitting on the steps of the house we were living at the time and crying, thinking to myself, who are we? And we took the leadership team and we went to the mountains for two days and we locked ourselves in a room and I said, we're not leaving here until we know who we are. Because you can know what you do but not know who you are. And the problem with knowing what to do when, and you don't know who you are is you don't have any kind of, any plumb line to govern your life by. And I said, we're not leaving here till we have core values established. And from now on, our core values will determine our direction. Our vision will point us to the right place, but we'll never violate a core value of who we are just to get to a common place. Okay, let me make it real for you. There's nothing wrong with you wanting to be successful. There's nothing wrong with you wanting to be wealthy. You know what I found? The amount of money doesn't matter. The amount of money I have doesn't matter as much as how I get it. And, and if you don't know who you are and stay true to that, then, then you'll destroy every fabric of your DNA to get a purpose done. I, just this week, man, I, I was doing some stuff this week. God had opened up some doors and I was... And I was just wide open. And you know what I realized? Yesterday, got convicted twice yesterday. 
because I was fulfilling purpose, but I'd forgotten who I was. There were people that I loved that were suffering. I'm riding down the road, and my wife said, you're too busy. You're too busy. She said, I, I know God's doing a lot of stuff, but you're too busy. Like, I need you. Our kids need you. Our church needs you. Your leaders need you. And I was like, you know what I thought about? Cutting corners. I know what God told me to do, but I can't just do his will if I don't do it his way. Jesus said it like this in Mark. He said, what good is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul? You know what he's saying? What good is it to arrive at a place that you've been called to go, but when you show up, you don't even know who you are when you get there? So what does God want? God wants you to do his will his way. His will his way. You can, you can, you can make your kids behave. You can scream at them until their ears bleed. You can wear them out all up and down. And you can put enough fear in them that they'll no longer act up. You can. Now, now some of them, I know you say, you ain't met mine. Yeah, you're right, but most of the time. But you know what? What are you going to lose in the process? Because how you do it is just as important as... What's going to happen is they're going to turn 17 ain't going to speak to you no more. And you're going to end up alone. Oh, but they behaved... Yeah, but they don't love you because you instilled fear. You can use fear to motivate, but that's not of God. Y'all ain't saying nothing, but it's all right. You know why? Because where I'm going isn't the only thing that's important. How I get there. And God doesn't just want me to do his will. He wants me to do his will his way. I'll end with this. Listen, there's a story. It's about shortcuts. Shortcut. You, can't, you can't take shortcuts. The title of this message I told somebody is going to be Stop Lights and Shortcuts. Stop Lights and Shortcuts. And you know what you know, I hope? I hope that we stop hating stop lights and loving shortcuts and we'll reverse the process. Uh, there, was a, there was a story of a, a general contractor and he, he had this master carpenter that had been with him for, for 20 years. And the master carpenter came to him one day and he said, You know what, boss? He said, I'm done. I'm, I'm retiring. I'm just going to enjoy the rest of my life. And it really upset the general contractor. He's like, man, you've been with me. You're my go-to guy. I can put you on any project. I hate to hear that, but I understand. He said, but before you go, I want you to do one more project for me. And I said, all right. So he goes and he comes back and he gives him some blueprints to build a house. Nice house, huge house, big house, very nice, all the bells and whistles. Guy looks at it and he goes, man, this is not how I want to, I'm, I'm trying to get out. Like this project, this magnitude, I, don't, I just don't have the energy for it. He said, no, 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 just do this for honor me before you get out of here. And he said, all right. So the guy starts building a house. And as he's building a house, and he's, and he's going through the process, and he's, he lays the foundation, and he starts putting the framing in place, and he starts doing the wiring, and he start, then he starts getting to the, the cosmetic parts. He, he, his heart wasn't in it. He, was, he, was, he had been checked out. So he began cutting corners. He began taking shortcuts. He began doing stuff he wouldn't normally do. He wasn't paying attention to detail that had made him the, the, the master craftsman that he was. And he just, he cut all the corners and, and just, because he just wanted to get finished with it. And he finished with it and he walks into the, to the general contractor's office one day and said, all right, boss, he said, it's done. I'm finished. Thank you. Appreciate you. I've enjoyed being here. But I'm retired. Boss said, hang on one second. And he reaches in the drawer and he pulls out a set of keys. And he says, the house you just built is your now he didn't know he cut corners. He knew he was a master craftsman. He would do a good job. And he says, Here, the house that you built is for you. And the carpenter said, If I'd have known that, I wouldn't have cut those. I wouldn't have taken short. I, I... Here's my point, church. It's not just enough for you to end up where God wants you. It's the way you handle the journey on the way. And you have to be careful because it can look like God, sound like God, feel like God, but God's saying something different. about five and a half years ago 
There's probably only two or three people who know this. I got a phone call from a friend. He said, man, he said, there's a church up here that's well established. Has a ton of resources. Pays a good salary. Has benefits. Has staff. Has everything that one would want. He said, and I think you'd be a good fit for it. I think you ought to apply for it. I remember trying to justify it by saying, God, I know what you showed me and I know what it looks like and where I'm at, it's hard for me to see the, from there to here and from here to there. But it looks like what I'm being told is a lot closer to there. And I said, man, that, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good opportunity. I was praying about it. I think I might have mentioned it to Julianne. I was getting my hair cut. And I just said, I'm praying about opportunity and I'm not sure what to do with it. And I remember my prayer time. God say it. You can get to where I've shown you that way. That's not my way. something different for you and I never even put my name in the hat because I knew in my heart even though in the natural it looked exactly like what God had showed me I knew in my heart it wasn't and I did and I thank God every day because I could have taken a shortcut and I could have ended up at a place that I feel like God was calling to and I'd have been in his will but it'd been my way I was sitting in an office of a good friend of mine pastors a very large church last week week before last and I said what's next for you and your ministry in this season you know what he said to me listen as he said I just want to do his will his way that's what started this whole message he said I just want to do his will but I want to do it his way and man that's me and I was like God that's my prayer and do you know why because if you do it your way you can end up with a piece of a robe when God wants you to have the whole thing you better put your hands together and give God some praise Come on. Just tell your neighbor, say stoplights. Tell your neighbor, say shortcuts. The path to your purpose is laid out before you. How about grabbing any person to your left or right? I know it's late, but. I'd just like to thank God for my cast and crew. You can stand up now, sheep. My prayer is that you would see your journey different. Don't despise the pauses in your story. every opportunity at face value to be something God's done for you. Pray about it. Act on it if you feel like that's God. But if it's not, learn to say, I'm okay. Because I don't just want to do His will. I want to do it His way. God, I just thank you for your goodness, for your tender mercies that are new for us every single day. Holy Spirit, guide and direct us as we leave this place. I come against right now the lies of the enemy that try to convince the people that they don't have purpose. Everyone under my voice has purpose, God. So give us the wisdom to walk it out, the discernment to make decisions, the strength to endure, 
and the heart to say no to man while saying yes to you. And we promise when we do arrive at our promise, when we do fulfill our purpose, when we do find ourselves in your will, that it will be done completely in your way. And we give you glory, honor, and praise for it. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. Amen, amen. Love you. God bless you. We got kingdom life right after. If not, we'll see you next week. If you guys are going to stay for the block party meeting, just meet me right up here up front. It won't take very long.